Welcome back to the B-Sides of Sports, Season 2, Episode 8. Uh, in this week's episode, it's all about the NBA playoffs. Obviously, we are now in the full swing of it, with two days ago being the official start after the play-in games, and I think we're really getting into it, and uh, just what I think is always the best time of year for basketball, especially if you're a fan, just because you're getting to see the teams you've wanted to all year, mostly at full strength. That's probably something we'll touch on a little later, is some of the injury troubles in the first few games, but regardless of that, we're going to start on the East and work our way over to the the West. Uh, the first matchup we wanted to highlight was the Heat at Bucks. Wilson, what were kind of your first impressions of this game? Yeah, this is a fun matchup. It's one that we've seen in the East quite a bit recently, and we know the challenges that these two teams kind of present for one another. Obviously, this year, the Miami Heat have not looked nearly as good as they have in recent years, and I think a large part of that this year has just been their size. You know, with Bam at their center spot against some of these bigger teams in the East, Miami is truly an undersized team, and although they play with such a level of toughness and grit you know at the end of the day they were playing 500 basketball and we kind of saw that in the play and I was kind of surprised I really thought the Heat were going to beat the Hawks and when Jimmy Butler kind of came out a little bit flat in that game we really just saw the Heat's offense really struggle to put points on the board and because of that I think this matchup has lost a bit of its allure so going into game one I really like the Bucks in six obviously a lot of things have changed now you know Giannis had that collision with Kevin Love we don't know the status of him although it seems likely that he's going to play and then for the Heat you know, just talked about their offensive struggles. The loss of Tyler here on my eyes is a huge deficit for the Heat and is really going to put a cap on their ability to win this series. That being said, obviously stealing game one, taking advantage of Giannis only playing 11 minutes is huge for them. Obviously, we know what the Heat um, can do at home. You know, they're not afraid of this matchup. So again, it seems a little simple to say, but it's it's really going to ride on the shoulders of Jimmy Butler. Now that Hero's out, he's really going to have to carry that offensive load. We know how old some of the rest of that roster is. And as good of, of guard play as they've gotten out of guys like Struess and Gabe Vincent, um, again, I think it just comes down to what Jimmy Butler is going to be able to do. Um, I still like the Bucks in six, especially because I don't think Giannis is going to be out for a long period of time. But I'm definitely rooting for the Heat. I just I really like what Jimmy Butler can do. Yeah, no, and that's kind of, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Obviously, they're an interesting team. Like you said, they play very small. I mean, they technically, again, per traditional positions with Struess, Hero, and Vincent being out there. I mean, they're starting three guards. And, I mean, throw in the fact Jimmy's a two guard, arguably, in a three. So, I think you can make an argument he plays both. So, it really is just not what they want having to play a Bucks team with. I mean, some of, I think, the better bigs in the league. Brooke Lopez is a fantastic big. Uh, Bobby Portis, I know technically he's listed as forward, but with his size, just creates all sorts I mean, of matchups. He's 6'10". Exactly. That's like a center, and especially today's NBA that's so small. Uh, and Again, obviously, same thing with Giannis. So I agree with you that uh, I think they win in five or six games, but Miami's stealing one in Milwaukee, I think it's huge and speaks a lot to, again, Jimmy Butler. We seem to talk about him every playoffs, but that's just because he's just so good. And I think we really see, again, um, I, I, we talked about him in this podcast a little bit earlier in the year, just kind of about how his numbers really don't do him justice. And I feel like he's always a conversation topic, you know, people underrating or overrating him just because his stats are, he's one of the few players where his stats really just don't show the impact he has. So it's always nice when he, you know, comes into the playoffs and then, you know, against maybe the best team in the NBA on paper, he puts up 35, 11 and five. I mean, just, I mean, unbelievable numbers. And so, uh, I agree with your point. I just think Miami's too small and Milwaukee's too good, but, uh, it would be a cool story if Miami was somehow able to do it. Yeah, and there's a lot of things to really like about the Heat, right? Like, I think they're a very easy team to root for. You know, basketball fans, we love the purest, play hard every possession, play really hard defense, never give up. And it's truly incredible what Jimmy's able to do in the playoffs, right? Like, this is a guy that routinely will have nights in the regular season where he's scoring in single digits, you know? Jimmy Butler scores 12 in a regular season game and nobody bats an eye. And then come the postseason, all of a sudden, he's dropping 40-point triple doubles every other night. So the Jimmy Butler thing is really just an example of a guy that elevates his play in the postseason kind of ironic to a degree considering that the heat's brand is how hard they play night in and night out the other thing i think that's to like about the heat is the spolstra factor right like he's arguably the best coach in basketball right now and i think he helps them execute a strategy that has historically worked for them very well against the bucks i just i echo your concern like on paper the bucks just have much more talent middleton's coming into shape 
You know, Holiday has having some of his early playoff struggles that he always has every year, but he's still solid both sides of the ball. And, you know, if everyone's healthy out there for the Bucks, it's really hard to see this Tyler hero list Miami offense being able to score even 100 a night. And that's not going to get it done against Milwaukee. No, and I agree. And uh, just kind of my last things on it really are. I've always loved Eric Spolstra. I think he's a fantastic coach. I don't know why his name isn't more in the conversation for being one of the more elite coaches in the NBA because I feel like his rosters on paper are never impressive. And obviously this year they were the most injured team going into the playoffs of the playoff team. So, and to still just have the success they have, I think they kill in the coaching debate. I do not like Mike Boltenhoser. I do not think he's a good coach. Watching the finals even, you're watching Giannis, you know, a few years ago have to lift his team. It really didn't feel like Boltenhoser was the one making the decisions to help the team. It really felt like Giannis. So, you know, as my kind of last big thing on this series, I really think, like you said, Eric Spolster is a great coach, but with a loss of a guy like Tyler Hero, who's one of your more dynamic scores, it's just kind of hard to swing in your favor. Absolutely. I think with that, then we hop over to the Cavaliers four seed and the New York Knicks five seed matchup. This one's fun, right? I think looking at the Eastern Conference playoffs, most people had this one circled as the one that was going to be the most competitive, considering that we kind of have put the Bucks, the Celtics and the Sixers in that upper echelon of the East. This series is tough to call. Um, what are your early thoughts on the series? Obviously, game one has already happened. Um, you know, the Knicks came away with a victory. Who are you taking and why? Yeah, so I, I still think... I'm going to go with Cleveland just because I think a lot of the things that stood out to me is Donovan Mitchell is kind of, I think, going to soon be in the Jimmy Butler category of playoff caliber players because it just seems like every game I watch him play, I think there's any like five games of 40 points uh, already. And, you know, he's in his early 20s. So, I mean, just such a volume score. And it's not only that, you know, he's he's getting steals. He had three steals in that game. Um, so I, I think again, the star power, the, who has the better player, I think Donovan Mitchell is the best player in this series. I think the Knicks might have a little bit better of a team, a little more experience. I love Julius Randle and he's a very good vet and obviously Mobley playing as terribly as he did. I just, you know, like, obviously you don't think that's going to happen every night, especially with how high of a caliber player I feel like he is. He just did not shoot the ball well. And I think they said it was something like Darius Garland only taking 13 shots was real surprising to me. Um, and again, I think that might have just been nerves. Again, another young player. So I think, you know, if the Cavs, even if the Cavs go down in a 2-0 hole, I think they can pull it back just because I think they have more talent. I just think the New York Knicks are a little uh, older, a little more mature. And obviously with Jalen Brunson coming into his own, just a fantastic player. It's seems like he pulls anything he pulls for mid range is in. I mean, all the contested mid ranges he shot to win the game for them. Uh, so I do have the Cavs in six, but uh, I really could see the Knicks winning this one. This to me is one of the easiest ones to flip flop on. Yeah, this series is tough to call. There's a lot of things like on both sides. I think what we saw early on in that first game is it was quickly evident how good these defenses are. And to my surprise, obviously it was documented that the Cavs were the number one overall defense this past year. The Knicks were the number four overall offense. And it did not look like that at many points throughout this game, in large part because of how well the Cavs are defensively. But the Knicks also, we know their brand of tough nose, physicality. Thibodeau's obviously branded for his defense. And while the Knicks defense wasn't a top 10 defense, Defense this year um you know in the po postseason when the place was down a little bit you know the guys that he's putting out there can all defend they play hard and so the game was kind of a slugfest a lot slower pace than some of these other high scoring explosive first round matchups we've seen so far and uh, I, I think for me i really want to lean on the pedigree of some of the players for all year the concern with the cavaliers for me has been just how young the roster is looking at guys like garland mobley even guys like isaac okoro you know these are guys that haven't been on the stage yet and i think pedigree does matter especially in a playoff series where you're playing seven games right it's not so much of this one-off energy where anything can happen over the course of a seven game playoff series usually the better team's going to win and to me i just think the knicks are going to be the better team uh, i go back to I, I really like the addition of jalen brunson for the knicks i think he's really taken them to a next level and i think the other concern for me on the cavalier side of the ball is and you mentioned kind of the hesitations of mobley the lack of shot attempts from Garland. I think as good as Donovan Mitchell is, he demands so much attention. He's going to carry so much of the offense. I think in some ways that's going to work against the Cavs this first time out into the playoffs because I think guys like Garland and Mobley are going to lean on Mitchell a little bit too much. And I don't think Mitchell himself is enough to necessarily carry the Cavs to win over the Knicks. And that being said, you know, I'm, I'm saying Knicks in seven. That's my pick, but I'm right with you. I think it could go either way. And to me, this is the most fun basketball purist one. I think there's going to be a lot of good defense and a lot of tough shot making. Yeah, no, and I think that's a good a 
a good point, and I think you capitalized on it well because, again, it is funny to say, but Donovan Mitchell is one of the older players on the Cavaliers, especially, again, older player who's been a star on another team. So he really is, like, as, as far as I'm concerned, like the face of Cleveland right now. When I think of the Cavs, I think of him. He really could make the first team all pro team or all NBA, excuse me. So, and I just really think he cemented himself as one of the better two guards in the league. And I mean, just the volume he scores at reminds me a lot of D Wade, the way he plays. But like you said, I think just like D Wade and especially on some of those early teams, D Wade won very early in his career on his rookie contract, which was crazy. Right. And I obviously Mitchell hasn't done that, but I don't think the Cavs again are making any crazy run this year, but I could see in a year or two here loading up. I could see them having a ton of success because I really do think they have all the pieces. I mean, having guys like Ricky Rubio and Osman off the bench, Karis Levert too played terrible in this game. I mean, that's, that's a talented bench. So I, I really think they're good. And I completely, you know, see eye to eye with you on the Knicks uh, winning because, like I said, this series is one that's hard for me to pick either way. Yeah, it's a tough one. And the the last thing I kind of think is a little interesting about this matchup, and I think it hasn't really been documented that much by the national media, is the fact that Mitchell, in the eyes of many people this offseason, was slated to go to the Knicks. And now he finds himself in a first round series against the team that obviously did not end up trading for him. He's on the Cavs. And while I think he is happy in Cleveland, I just think it's a small thing to monitor, you know, like, it's it's a real thing that players want to go play for these big markets and we know how how especially this younger generation of players how they make little things their agenda i'm not saying it's going to play a role but at the back of my mind i do wonder if mitchell is going to play the series a little more single-mindedly than he would have normally just because it is the knicks yeah no and i mean again the large market versus small market thing is a very big thing and i think that's present in our next matchup we're going to talk about as we switch up over to the west we are going to go warriors kings obviously two teams uh that have, I, I would say, done very well this year for what they had. Kings obviously have just done well overall, and the Warriors dealt with a lot of injuries and a weirdly terrible away record. Uh, but regardless, I think both teams have a lot of merit of being a true contender in the West. So, Wilson, what's kind of your, your first impressions of seeing the series and watching that game? Yeah, I think, you know, just to start off with the Warriors and that road record, it's hard to not be surprised at the outcome, right? If I said that right, like, I don't think it's very surprising that the Warriors lost a close game on the road when it's documented, you know, they had one win against a team above 500 on the road. The Warriors have been absolutely horrible on the road. So, you know, I, I think I go to the Warriors championship pedigree as the factor that I like the most in the series. And, you know, I said it earlier in a seven game series, the better team almost always wins, obviously minus external factors such as injuries or if something crazy happens off the court. And to me, I think that pedigree is really going to come through because the Warriors have been in every single one of these spots before that the Kings are finding themselves in the first place. And I'll give credit to the Kings. You know, you come out game one, crazy crowd. Obviously, you know, the, the tickets were going 600 on average absolutely absurd ticket prices a whole bunch of pressure on the kings to protect their home court and win the game and to their credit they did exactly that i think where i get concerned for the kings is as the series goes on the warriors have been in every single imagined spot before they've been down 1-0 they've been down 2-0 they know how to win on the road they know how to win a game five a game seven and because of that i you know it seems like the cop-out answer but i just i'm gonna trust the core of steph draymond and clay that hasn't lost a series in the western conference since the Mark Jackson era. Like they have yeah. not lost a conference in the West under Steve Kerr. So because of that, I'm going to take the Warriors in six. But again, I'm not trying to disrespect the Kings. I think the Kings are incredible. I think what Fox and Sabonis and Monk and everyone has done this year is, you know, not to be understated. I think they were underrated for a large part of this year, but ultimately I'm going to lean on the, the championship pedigree. Yeah, no, and I agree. But I will say you, you said the Warriors have been in every position, and I agree with that because they have been up 3-1 and been the only <laughs> one to lose in the finals. That was the first, the first place <laughs> my right. mind went when you said that was – uh, but hey, they also, I think people always forget, they also beat OKC. OKC choked a 3-1 lead. In a year right where before, many people thought yeah. OKC was the best team, right? Russ, mm -hmm. Serge Ibaka, KD, yeah. Steven Adams was coming into his own. That was yep, a really no. good OKC team. That was, again, great playoffs too. But, uh, you know, on to the, you know, the matchup that's actually happening now. Uh, I agree with what you said. And, again, I, I think what we always what always sticks out to me in the playoffs is how much a good bench can do for a team watching guys like Fred Van Leet go off for the Raptors or Bobby Portis a few years ago. That to me always feels like a lot of teams have an edge off the bench. These older players really can just give you the advantage. I mean, it's guys like Ray Allen, you know what I mean? Who 
in the, for the Heat made one of the biggest shots in NBA history when he was in his later years and not a volume shooter like he was when he was young. And I think both of these teams have a that guy in Jordan Poole and Malik Monk. I'm high on both of them. I love the way they both play. One, because they're just very like, you know, they believe they can make every shot they take. And I just love that mentality. Um, and two, I just think it gives them such unique X factors off the bench. And obviously Malik Monk out Jordan Poole. I mean, with, I think maybe the best performance besides De'Aaron Fox in that first game, I mean, 32 points off the bench in under 30 minutes is insane production. And I know Malik Monk has been having a very slept on year, a career year of his, but I'm just glad to see, you know, a guy like him really get the shine that he deserves in these playoffs. And I think that's what I like about this series is the Kings. Again, I've always been someone who's knocked on the Kings. I've watched of all the NBA teams. Games. The team I probably watched the least games from is the Kings. And so I'm, I'm glad they're in the playoffs and they're relevant again because it gives me a reason to start watching them and start rooting for them. And so uh, I do agree with you, though. I do think the Warriors win this one just because even no matter how bad your away record is, I mean, they were one shot from w- tying this game going into OT where they could have won very easily. I mean, two missed shots that they usually would make. So I do kind of agree with everything you said in terms of the pedigree of the Warriors, I think to me is what stands out in this series. I will say Sacramento has a huge home field advantage uh, with their loud fans and the Warriors sucking away this year. But still, I, I do have the Warriors in six for this one. Yeah, I think the other thing that's really interesting and kind of the key to look for in this matchup is there's so many elite guards in this matchup, right? We've got, obviously, on the Warriors side, you've got Steph, Clay, Jordan Poole's coming into his. We know how good GP2 is defensively. Um, and, and then you flip over to the, the King side of the ball. De'Aaron Fox is amazing. Kevin Herter's a guy that had a quiet game one. We know he can go off. Malik Monk, you touched on. And even Davion Mitchell, you know, they call him off night for his defense. Um, it's a really fun matchup. And it got me thinking a little bit about the King's history. Um, you know, to me, about a year ago, you and I were having really long conversations about Tyrese Halliburton, who now plays for the Pacers, obviously. Um, and, and how, you know, to me, that really signified the Kings making a huge mistake, right? They're trading away a guy who had said that he would want to be a franchise player. He wanted to be inside. Sacramento. Obviously, the franchise has been marred and missing the playoffs for the past 16 years. And so I think it, it kind of has gone under the radar how well the Kings have played this year. In many ways, it, to me, it mirrors what we saw with the Eagles this year, where a lot of people didn't want to give the Eagles their respect until it was way deep in the postseason. And it's just a true testament to how the, the Kings had the vision to trust in De'Aaron Fox, bringing in a guy like Sabonis to give them some really nice power forward big man play. Um, you know, the, the Kings have done an incredible job. And as you know, I I've said I think the Warriors are going to win in six. Um, if they, if there was a team to beat the Warriors, I would be happiest if it was the Kings. So, again, you know, I think the Warriors are going to win, but a small part of me is rooting for the Kings. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And then for our last Western matchup, uh, we're talking about what I think was of the first night of games. This was, I think, the most exciting uh, of the ones I watched. At least I enjoyed it the most. Uh, and that's obviously being the Clippers Suns. Clippers Suns, obviously both teams that had big uh, in-season acquisitions that kind of have framed up their second half of the years with neither of them having great success, Kevin Durant being injured and the Russell Westbrook Clippers struggling to find out how to play them. Uh, both teams have had a lot of struggles, but obviously we bo- all knew the talent was there. So Wilson, I know the Clippers are a team you've always kind of been higher on than I was, and neither of us are high in the Suns, but how are you looking at this one going into it? Yeah, like, you know, like the 4-5 matchup in the East, I think this is the hardest one to call in the West. And, you know, on paper, I would have liked it even more, of course, if Paul George was healthy. But even with Paul George out, the Clippers have an incredible amount of depth, right? They've got a guy in Robert Covington who, to my opinion, like in my opinion, could start for some NBA teams. He doesn't even play in their rotation. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, he came in for a game a couple of weeks ago. He had six threes. I think it was like yep. six of eight Sixers on threes. Sixers legend. It's like, yeah. Sixer this- legend, Rob Covington. <laughs> it's incredible. But this guy's not even in the rotation. It really speaks to the depth the Clippers have. I thought this was going to be a seven-game series anyway. And, you know, you and I have the benefit of hindsight now with these game ones being out of the way. I like the Suns early, right? Like it was, you know, Kevin Durant and the Suns hadn't lost a game. Obviously, they were getting a huge amount of rest. I think it's huge for a guy like Chris Ball, who's in the later stage of his career. But seeing the Clippers and their hustle and their fight it's something that we haven't seen in this Clippers team the last couple of years and to, to that I really want to give the credit to Russ he played his hard on defense you know he shot horrifically from the field I want to say it was three of 19 absolutely yep. atrocious but he made the winning plays down the stretch and that's not really something we've said about Russ historically um, but again all credit to Russ and because of what I saw in the Clippers I think the belief is there obviously Kawhi and his load management strategy always works out for him give me the Clippers in seven 
Yeah, no, I agree. I say I have Clippers in six, though. I just think they'll figure it out wow. earlier. Um, and also, again, you brought up the Westbrook thing, and I think that's the most interesting because the Lakers, I think, taught him, and he kind of had to start to learn how to be an off-ball player. And part of that was the intensity we saw on offense was translated over to defense. So this is a stat I found. This is per the NBA's matchup data. Russell Westbrook was on Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Chris Paul for 59 possessions last game. In those possessions, they made only six points on 25% from the field. Which wow. is insane. And wow. not to mention, he out-rebounded everyone but Chris Paul, which is weird. They tied, okay? And Zubak obviously out-rebounded him. But I mean on the Suns. So, again, I think, like you said, that intensity the Clippers have as well as the depth to me is what really sticks out. When you have a point guard who's out-rebounding a team center that doesn't want to play there and he <laughs> had his deal matched last minute. And so, I mean, I think we've kind of seen that from Aiden this year. I don't think he's putting his all into it, which I don't 100% blame him, blame him for. And obviously, Kevin Durant barely playing with them. I don't think they've had nearly enough time to figure out how to play. So I know the new Suns owner was like, he wanted to make an impact right away, right? So that's why he traded for KD. But that's the thing with KD, uh, especially we've seen later in these years. He's almost like Diet Kyrie. And I'm not meaning that in terms of like, you know, saying crazy stuff and off the court, but Kevin Durant just brings a lot of stuff with him that isn't basketball related. I truly believe he is the greatest scorer Probably in NBA history. I think that's fair to say. In terms of if you need a bucket from anywhere on the floor, I think Kevin Durant has as good of a chance as almost anyone. That being said, there's just so much that comes with them, and I don't think the Suns have had time to figure out how that works in their team. Meanwhile, the Clippers, like you said, Westbrook has won now two playoff games shooting three for 19, which is a stat that's a weird yeah, he's one. Two he, that's... Yeah, that's a weird stat to have. But again, it's things like that. And like you said, Kawhi Leonard and his load management, he plays amazing in the playoffs and he's really coming to his own late. So to win without arguably your second best player, and I'd say. I mean, I think Paul I think George inarguably of, your second yeah. best player. I think he's definitively your second best player. No, I agree. So to beat a team who was again playing at relatively full strength and had Kevin Durant and Booker playing over forty minutes, and you can't beat a team without their second best player. And don't get me wrong, I love Eric Gordon. I've always think he's been a slept on player, especially on all those Rocket teams. But still, he's not Paul George, and he never has been. And that's no discount to him, but Paul George is such a good player. So if they manage to win without having to use Paul George in this first series, I think that might spell trouble for the rest of the West, which is a pretty wide open division in terms of, I think, not one team dominating. But I think this if if they can make it out of this series alive, I think this could be the year they finally do it. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much, you know, I, I think you just went through a plethora of different points on these, this matchup and these two teams in particular. There's so much to really dive into in this matchup. And part of it is there are just so many names. It's kind of wild that this is a four or five matchup, right? And again, it speaks to how crazy and just wild the West was this year. Looking at the Sun side of things, there were just a lot of things that were concerning to me. And in a playoff series where it's all about adjustments, I question if Monty Williams and the Suns are going to be able to make the right adjustments in order to win four games. And to me, you know, picking the Clippers, I think the answer is no. Uh, I'd quickly start with KD only took 15 shots. KD played 45 minutes in a playoff game and took 15 shots. To add to that, and you know, this is kind of one of those outlier stats. I don't think it's correlated necessarily because of KD's play, but KD's one in nine in his last 10 playoff games, and he's lost seven straight. At one point, you know, we have to look at KD. If we take away those Warriors years, he has not had the best playoff record. Obviously, they made it to the finals that year and there were injuries some years, you know, but, you know, blowing 3-1. You, you, you mentioned it earlier. We don't talk about it because the Warriors lost to LeBron. KD lost up 3-1 against the Warriors and he was horrific in those last three games of that series. His efficiency was way down below and and we kind of saw last year in that Boston series, you know, the Boston wing defenders were really able to make him uncomfortable and he was not efficient. You know, he had a, he had a couple big scoring outputs, but overall, you know, his, his play did not contribute to winning basketball and I just go back to, I don't think the Suns are going to be able to figure it out. I think what we saw in the regular season was kind of that early on honeymoon, small sample size, everything's kind of going well, it's the regular season. Now that teams are honed in on strategy for what they do i mean there's just small things in the suns that i just don't like even something as small as you know devin burke at the end of that game russ you know blocked him and then he threw yeah. the ball off at devin booker booker in the air started complaining about no call like what are you doing the ball is still alive and you know to me that's just those are the small errors that are going to bite them in the rear and again clippers and seven 
Yeah, no, and that's a great thing. And also, I love Ty Lue. That was something we didn't touch on. Um, and you t- you already touched on Monty Williams, right? But um, I think Ty Lue gets underrated because he was a LeBron coach and they all kind of get swept under the rug. But I think some of the things he did, especially with the undermanned teams and still being able to find success um, in those early playoffs, uh, speaks wonders on what he is. And like he's doing now, I just think something about Ty Lue when he's missing a player, he really just pulls out all the stops, I think. And uh, it, it showed again in this series. I mean, that's a great point. And other than, you know, the Clippers obviously had that disastrous collapse against collapse against the Nuggets a couple of years ago. But other than that, honestly, the Clippers have overachieved to some degree under Ty Lue, right? We know that Paul George and Kawhi have had a tough bill of health, but, you know, they, they pushed the Suns a couple of years ago without Kawhi six games. Um, I think that's something that, that, again, it plays a role in the series, so. Yeah, no, I agree. And now to go into our last segment, these are just our playoff superlatives is what we're lightly calling them. Pretty much just wanted to highlight some more individual players um, and have the opportunity to talk about some guys that we didn't talk about their matchups. And so the first one we had was guys that you can just rely on in the playoffs. They're, you know, your Jimmy Butler's like we talked about earlier. The guys who you just know when the big moment comes, they don't shy away from it. They embrace it. So, Wilson, what, what, what were the guys you had for this? Yeah, so Drake, this was fun for me, and we don't do a lot of lists on this show, but I made a list for this one, so I will walk you through one through five. I have an honorable mention as well, and then you can kind of give me your thoughts on it. But So I went with the top five most reliable postseason players. So that's, in my eyes, the word reliable, it doesn't mean the best player, right? This is not necessarily an order of this is the best guy, this is the second best guy. To me, this is, in the playoffs' biggest moments, who's done it before, who's proven it, and who do I trust? And so... um I'll go one through five. I'll start at the top. And sadly, I had to put LeBron at one. And there's a lot been made about LeBron's performances in the postseason. But I think if we take away, or not even take away, if we look at LeBron post-Dallas, I think it's inarguable he has been the best playoff performer of this generation. His numbers are insane. The fact that LeBron can replicate what he does in the regular season on a higher level in the postseason is just you know, people already think LeBron might be the greatest regular season player of all time. If he plays better in the postseason, I think it just tells you enough, you know, what you need to know about this guy. And even small sample size things, LeBron has been great in the playoff games. You know, he had that triple double against the Warriors and that one they had a couple of years ago. Obviously he was, um, you know, not great, but very good against the Timberwolves. And, you know, I think if it's a game five, it's game six and game seven. I just trust what LeBron's done. Even with his age, I think he's going to make the right play at the right time. You know, the pass to Dennis Schroeder is a great example of that. So I've got to put LeBron at one. Number two, I'm going to go Steph. And Steph is not someone I would have had in even the top five a year ago. But watching what he did in 2022, that playoff run, and particularly what he did to the Celtics, I think Steph, now we have a large enough sample size to see that, you know, a guy averaging, you know, 25, 26, 27, 28 in the finals is not a regular thing. And for Steph to do that across six different final series, again, I go back to the Warriors have not lost in the West in the Steve Kerr era. A lot of that is Steph Curry because he's the engine that makes that offense run. I've got Steph at two. And then I'll finish out my next three pretty quickly. Giannis at three. I think Giannis is the best player in the sport right now. And I'm going to give LeBron and Steph the OG nod. But in terms of, you know, who do I trust, especially in what we've seen last couple of years, that 2021 run that Giannis had was absolutely incredible. 50 point game doesn't get talked about enough. 16 of 18 from the free throw line. You know, dude's a 65% free throw shooter and he made 16 of 18 in the biggest game of his career. Enough said about that. Four is a guy we just talked about in Kawhi. I think, you know, I hate the load management stuff, but the sad reality is it works for Kawhi every single year. And all of a sudden, you know, down the stretch, he's playing 40 minutes a night. He's playing both sides of the ball. And, you know, I think Kawhi very much is as good of a chance as anyone else in the West to win his, you know, a title this year. And that would be three titles from three different teams. He's just a proven player. The number five, I'm going to go Jimmy Butler. I think, you know, Butler, we talked about him extensively at the beginning of the pod. You know, he's a guy that he, he doesn't play the same. He actually elevates his play, and that's rare in today's NBA. Um, he doesn't get rattled. He's there in the big moments. Um, I put the honorable mention nod to KD, and the reason I knock KD a bit, I having him outside of this top five is what we talked about. You know, the recent playoff success has not been there, and, uh, you know, he's struggling in some of the biggest moments, so. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think the only thing I might have changed is, like I said, I know Donovan Mitchell is still young in his career, um, but some of the games we've seen from him, again, it hasn't translated to team success, but it's kind of like the opposite of Kevin Durant. In the losses that he's had, it seems like he's the star on the team. So uh, I think that was just kind of my biggest takeaway from those is I agree with the LeBron thing. I mean, I've, I've 
I mean, I think he's the greatest of all time. And I think a lot of that's been cemented on what I've seen in the playoffs is even again, when he's losing, that's not what you're paying. I mean, to almost win finals MVP on a losing team. I think that speaks volumes. Um, and Steph, uh, again, I don't know if your list was in any particular order. I still, you know, Steph, just now winning finals MVP in the playoffs. I think he's a fantastic player. It's come finals that, you know, he's historically struggled outside of last year. Um, but I understand having him. Cause like you said, uh, I think he's finally kind of figured it out in those big games. Uh, and then again, I obviously agree with Giannis. I mean, just watch the playoffs when they won it. I mean, that's all you need to watch to see that Jimmy Butler, kind of the same thing where they were talking about just, I mean, 30 points in all but one game now. Both playing games was the best player on the court, I think. And, uh, yeah, I just – what 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 a unique thing to elevate your game across the board in the playoffs. And, obviously, I know you brought up Kawhi, and I agree. I mean, he won the, my Raptors uh, finals three years ago. So, obviously, I'm going to agree with that one. Yeah, I like the addition of Donovan Mitchell to the list. You know, I was heavy on the veterans and kind of the guys that have been in the league for a long time. But I think you're right. Um, I, I don't remember specifically what it was, but Donovan, I think, has a top 10 points per game average in the playoffs um, to, to date. And that's incredible. I mean, especially because you're right. He, he has demanded so much of the attention of the defense in a lot of these series for him to still average, you know, kind of an easy 27, 28 is what it seems like for Mitchell at times is, is incredible and a testament to how he has been as a player in the postseason. Yeah, and that was just kind of my thing is, you know, you did really have veterans, and he is still only 26, which in the NBA is like, I mean, you're barely getting started, it feels like. Well, people nowadays. are still calling Brandon Brandon Ingram a, a young player. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, exactly, and that's just kind of how the NBA is compared to um, a lot of the other ones. But And then the, the last one we had for this one is kind of the, the uh, superlative for, you know, what it means for their legacies. I mean, I think – the storylines in the NBA are, I think, one of the big selling points. We know these players all so well in their faces. We see them all the time. They're on everything. So we really know this and these legacies. We know everything about them almost to a painful degree in some for some people. So I just think that's what's so interesting. And so just to start us off, Wilson, who did you have for this one in terms of the guys whose legacies are on the line or could be rewritten by this by a good playoff run here? Yeah, I'm going to go to my favorite team here, and I think it's because it's kind of a three-headed snake in terms of guys that have a lot to game, and, and with that three-headed snake, I'm going to go Embiid, Harden, and Doc. Um, I think all three of them have kind of a somewhat negative connotation around their playoff performances so far. You know, Harden's a guy that you and I have talked about kind of unfairly, gets a lot of slack for his play in the postseason. Obviously, he's got a couple really bad moments on the the resume right the san antonio game six was obviously pretty bad and then i think you know just he had the unfortunate luck of running into the warriors every single year um obviously wasn't great for him you know making it to the finals as the guy on a roster so i think harden has the opportunity to kind of rewrite that narrative for himself the same thing for Embiid. you know if Embiid wins the mvp this year he would be the only mvp uh, winner to not make the conference finals and you know that's actually a major thing that means Embiid's never made it out of round two so again I think a lot rides on this year for Embiid um, in a year where we've kind of associated the Sixers all year with the big three in the east if Philadelphia loses to the Celtics presumably in the second round again that's got to knock him you know he's um, every single year it's like Embiid has these great regular seasons these great first round series and he can never get out of round two and then I'd wrap up it with Doc um you know Doc's a guy that's kind of in a weird spot a couple years ago after that 2008 championship people were saying doc is you know one of the greatest coaches of all times and then since then you know a couple runs with the clippers and even with the sixers a lot of people have have think have thought that doc is kind of underachieved and so again i think this is an opportunity for doc to establish you know it's it's been documented he's done a great job coaching this team this year he's built a great relationship with them beat him and harden seem to finally be getting on the same page if doc is able to you know not even just win the chip but get to the finals with this team, I think it again rewrites kind of the perception on what we see Doc as and probably would cement him as the top 15 coach of all time. No, I think that's fair. I and like you said, I think the Sixers do have a lot just because of that that dynamic of three guys who really do need one because Doc won with a very talented Celtics team and then had a very talented Clippers team for years, couldn't get it done. Like you said about Joel Embiid already, would be the only MVP if he wins it to not make the conference finals. I think that's huge, not to mention he's one of the best bigs uh, in the game right now, if not the best. I think the best. But um, And then Harden, obviously, I mean, my all-time favorite basketball player. Um, always wanted him to win one. I thought they were finally going to do it that year with Chris Paul before he went down with injury um, against the Warriors. It really looked like they finally had everything shaping up. Couldn't get it done. So I think it's interesting. And it's um, 
I think the legacies of those guys are a lot and just kind of Harden's legacy also reminds me a lot of Westbrook's where, you know, these are guys who were one thing for their most of their careers and then had to make a dramatic career shift due to almost extraneous um, external circumstances. Um, and Westbrook, you know, has a unique opportunity. There's a very real chance if they beat the Suns and KD, his old teammate that he couldn't get it done with, then he could beat the Lakers and knock out the team that traded him because he wasn't good enough. Uh, so he was another player I just kind of thought of as the sort of legacy series just because, uh, again, you know, some of the most talented players in the modern era, I, I think Harden and Westbrook are, uh, but they both just struggled to get it done on the biggest stage. And I can't remember who it was talking about it. I think it was Spencer Dinwiddie on a podcast talking about how ring culture or it might have been J.J. Redick. Ring culture has just been real bad for the league because there are so many guys who don't win a ring and we just write them off. Dame. And Dame, was that who it was? Yeah, I think it was Dame yeah. that was talking about how he, he, he doesn't like the state of the NBA because of yeah. ring culture. No, and, and I completely agree with that because, again, some of my favorite players of all times have one or no rings. Um, Kyle Lowry's another one of the guys I really like, DeMar DeRozan. And so, you know, DeRozan having none, same with Harden. I mean, there's two of my favorite players that haven't won the big one yet. And, I mean, I'm still going to die on a hill that they're, two, you know, two of the greatest offensive players of this generation. But without those rings, people are just going to be a lot more impartial to your, you know, Steph Curry's and stuff. And not yeah, that I'm absolutely. saying I think they're better than Steph. I, that's not what I'm implying. But no, but what I you're saying think, is valid, yeah. yeah. For everyone else that isn't me, a ring means so much to a legacy. And I just think there are so many guys this year who a ring could help heaps for their all-time conversations. Yeah, and, and and you know to your point, I think the Russ arc would be really cool to see. You know, it's a guy who has gotten really an unwarranted amount of flack for his play over the last couple of years because you know so many of these teams are forcing Russ to be something that he isn't, and that would be just really cool to see Russ win a ring with the Clippers, especially as we know he's playing a huge role in contributing to their ability to win. So that would be really cool. Um, as we wrap up, I wanted to say, you know, you and I we don't say too many controversial things, but you mm -hmm. you kind of brushed aside that you said Embiid was the best big in the league and. <laughs> there might be some Jokic people out there that you know, there's going to be some, you know, <laughs> some hate coming into us. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, every time, uh, for whatever reason, that's the conversation because apparently a guy who shoots the ball 12 times a game is as good as one who takes over games uh, with his just dominance footwork and shooting ability, but whatever. Oh, yeah, and, you know, Jokic has the uh, somehow the fourth best – uh, box score plus or minus of all time in a season. It's the warp. It's the warp. <laughs> dude, it's the most. It, these advanced stats are the are the worst, dude. It's it's all the baseball fans who got bored of baseball and they they snuck over to the NBA and gave us all these random advanced stats that no one cares about, but they're hey, trying the to stats force tell you, onto us. The stats tell you that Jokic is a top ten defender of all time. So I think to that maybe we need to stop the slander because Jokic might be in the conversation for the greatest player of all time already. I guess three time MVP, maybe, you know, <laughs> back to back to it's back. Incredible. But. It's incredible. But yeah, I think that'll about wrap our pod for today. Um, you know, to all the listeners out there, if you're a viewer today on YouTube, thank you guys for tuning in. You know, Drake and I are having a really good time putting together, you know, now the visual component of this. And, you know, we always say it every week, we're going to try to get better. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. See ya.